Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. I was going to say welcome, but welcome to this session, to the in the morning session. And um, it's lovely to be here. It's my first time at a German conference, and uh, I think it's uh, quite a cultural experience for me, not just a privilege and an order to talk to you about learning analytics. Before we dive into some of the things I would like to talk about, I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me here. So I want to thank, thank Professor Ulrich Schroeder, Dr. Malte Persike, Rene Robke, Kevin Esser, and Kira Tallinn. I do not know how all of you look because I only corresponded to most of you by email, but uh, thank you so much for your effort uh, for organizing this event face to face. And also I'd like to thank Renee for all the kind words. I am certainly feeling the responsibility of talking about all of these things now that he has made this uh, wonderful opening for me. Um, however, at the time where I received the invitation, I felt that I had to address the current context, although I was invited to talk about learning analytics. So the talk that I have prepared for you today is sharing my thoughts on the current context and the area that I am very familiar with within that context. I certainly do not can tell with high certainty that I will um, think the same way a year from now, and maybe I won't think the same way by the end of this day, because I hope that these reflections that I had on the learning analytics in the age of AI will sh be shaped together in a conversation that we have. That is my way of saying that uh, these are just reflections, and I'm hoping to prompt you to think about things rather than claim any authority in the things I'm about to talk about. So I'll focus, uh, I'll describe the focus of the talk a little bit in the beginning. I'll explain to you how I understand learning analytics just to bring us on the same page. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the AI and education, but the point that I would like to make there will be mainly why I think today something is different than it used to be. And uh, I'll talk about the challenges that we face as an educational technology community that might happen, which means the changes and the promises that are being made around at the moment might not happen. And then I'll move towards the intersection of learning analytics and uh, artificial intelligence and my ideas around that. Um, I hope I'm not talking too fast. This is gonna be the pace of the next hour, so please uh, bear with me. So um, to start this talk, uh, I want to remind you that all of us in educational technology community are not new to the hype around technologies. Um, so on the first sight, one might ask, haven't we had already a whole assortment of innovations, new methods, new approaches, most notably new media and technologies? We had radio, we had film, we educational television, with computer-based instruction, promises about a rosy future reached a sky high. So have they made the promise difference in the classroom? Come to think of it, they have not. So why would technology make a difference now? This quote comes from a very old piece uh, written by somebody else, one of my favorite pieces. It was written in 2002, and the title of the article is Technology and Pedagogy, Why Don't We See the Promised Revolution? It was written by Gabriel Salomon, and this article, did, it, it, is as relevant as it was back then. Um, and I will stick to some of the arguments he's made in that piece and another piece throughout the talk. When we look at textbooks on educational technology, the print and press comes through as one of the early examples. I wanted to bring it up in the beginning to remind you that the impact of the print and press was only possible to see in retrospect uh, a lot later, and most educational technologies we have today, we haven't seen as long enough to understand their impact. But what was important about the print and press is that it changed our notion of literacy. Writing became original production of text, not copying and rewriting of existing texts. Reading became individual silent activity, not public reciting of text. Scholarship and expertise became something that referred to an expertise in knowledge in an area, rather than deep knowledge of a few religious texts. So that machine alone, now that we look back, changed our notion of literacy and things we do with information profoundly. Now, a lot of other technologies we're familiar with, such as a calculator, personal computer, the internet, smartphone, etc., 
we cannot really know the impact of those things in the same scale, but we know that already they are changing the way we practice teaching and learning in the classroom. And of course, as they appear, there was a lot of fear and a lot of resistance. So well, our calculator is killing our ability to work it out in our head. I checked it out. The calculator debate is still open. Uh, is social media killing off book reading? Is too much Minecraft bad for my child? Is massively open online education a threat or a blessing? Will learning analytics empower or entrap students? Mobile phones should be banned in schools. That's actually this year's. Uh, how chat GPT and similar AI will disrupt education? And of course, this is a normal reaction to something that comes through and threatens our ways of being. And as I said, it's hard for us to know the impact, looking at it from where we are. So in this talk, I would like to reflect with the little ability that I have, being human in this point in time, on the two educational that are fairly recent, so learning analytics and generative AI. I will not lecture you on AI because I think there are a lot more experts in this audience uh, on this uh, topic, but I will try to talk what sits on the intersection between these two areas. And I will try to reflect what are the challenges we face as an educational technology community that's always been interested in promoting technologies that support learning and teaching. So what can we do so that we actually see some of the promised changes made? So now that I've walked you through the focus of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about how I understand learning analytics. And I've been a part of the learning analytics community since 2015. This is my home community. And uh, so the vision of uh, my understanding of it is personal, but I'll uh, try to position it uh, against other people's work as well. For me, learning analytics has this important component of system-made data. So it's data streams that come from technologies that are being used for teaching and learning. It also, these data streams capture something about the learning process. And then these data streams are converted into something that presents feedback that a learner or a teacher can act upon. I also think there are three parts that are differentiate learning analytics from potentially, for instance, such areas as educational data mining. Part of it is data, feedback, and leadership. When I talk about data and learning analytics, we're talking about designing data that is aligned with epistemology, assessment, and pedagogy. So data that captures something that was intended for the learning process. Of course, such data can only be captured if there is a learning ecosystem designed, an infrastructure that was designed for these purposes. Uh, another important part of learning analytics for me is feedback. So that's not data for systems as it is in ITS, but it's data that's then packaged and communicated to humans. And so it's not enough to capture data that reflects engagement, performance, self-regulation, reflective writing, collaborative learning, cognitive load, engagement with video, retention. All of these already have been captured in existing work, but can we actually act on how this data is presented to a learner or a teacher. And then another part that's important to the learning analytics discourse and vision is uh, the notion of leadership. So that's something again that uh, refers to this notion that we are talking about feedback for humans. Learning analytics are a part of institutions, which means that we have leadership of pioneering leadership that's situated at a lower level of a classroom or student initiative, but also a bottom level, um, top-down initiatives, policies, and regulations that allow for these pioneering efforts to come through so that the systems we're building quietly in our classrooms can actually scale and make impact. So that's a part of the vision for learning, uh, learning analytics, and that's an important uh, roadblock, as I will also discuss a bit later. So all of these uh, different understandings over the past, um, well, now over a decade, uh, have um, spearheaded separate strands of work in learning analytics. Predictive learning analytics, predict predicting student dropouts has been a common theme for a long time. Engagement analytics, now act actually this is not called engagement analytics, but if you look at the studies uh, that a lot of uh, learning analytics work does, they capture engagement of students. So it's, I would argue that this is one of the most prominent areas we work within, uh, capturing uh, traces of engagement in the classroom. Communication analytics, that's something that people like to label collaborative analytics, but I would uh, be a little bit more careful saying that it's all sorts of process uh, measures that reflect how students communicate um, in the classroom. Multimodal learning analytics, a very, very popular area at the moment is catching up on the new tools and the ability to 
uh, record data streams face to face. A lot of this work is being done also in K-12 settings now in some countries where you can actually capture real time interactions. Um, writing learning analytics, so capturing keystroke data, capturing the type of uh, structures students use for writing, the arguments, providing feedback on how they structure um, their texts. Curriculum analytics, there's been a piece in science, I think it's this year written by a group of mostly US-centric colleagues uh, on curriculum analytics, looking at how we can analyze courses in a university, identifying bottlenecks and different types of assessments and those bottlenecks, providing a terrain that a student or an administrator can navigate uh, for uh, better choices. Employability analytics, colleagues at UTS are looking at mapping courses to job ads, trying to see whether the provisions that the university offers actually allows the student to pick the jobs they want or whether they need to add some things. So I'm not putting any names on this, but if you're interested in a particular area, please talk to me after because there is one or more programs of research uh, and institutional tools in uh, a good part of these different domains. And of course, there are also combinations of these. So a lot of you probably know Hendrik Drexler, who is talking about highly informative learning analytics. So combining these different analytics together to provide rich feedback, feedback about different things. A similar approach, but in a different settings in the University of South Australia, talking about learner profiles. So we're taking these different data streams. How can we describe a learner more holistically? Um, there's a lot. I mean, that's just... The community has been busy, uh, but not without challenges. So the three challenges I wanted to note here as I look at learning analytics today, one refers to adoption, and that is the institutional setting of learning analytics, right? So we've always built tools in the classrooms, and educational technology community knows how that goes very well. But it's a big step to build something that can scale and can be used by the entire institution can comply with the regulations of the university and the country, as well as evolve as technology develops. So that is a challenge that I think is probably the biggest uh, to overcome, but my sense is that time will sort a lot of these uh, things out. The second one is repro reproducibility. So that's something more of a micro level problem, meaning that we capture a lot of data streams uh, that come from technology, we label them, but we're doing that differently in different contexts with different tools. And so there is a challenge of knowing whether what one person measures and captures and labels in a particular way is exactly the same thing that another person does, which is why there's been a merger of research on some areas with psychometricians and learning analytics work. So there's a strand of work around that, trying to overcome the reproducibility crisis. And of course, there are implications for equity. Um, and here, I'd like to refer to work that's been done by more technical colleagues. So we're talking about evaluating predictive models for the bias that they have against different groups or evaluating impact of opt-in or opt-out on the balance of the data that we have and uh, the kind of implications that has for modeling and results uh, we can get. These are also serious challenges, um, but just to remind you, learning analytics has not been around as long as many other things have been. So I think it's good to be faced with challenges that we can name uh, as such as these. One can ask, so what, what is this learning analytics for? I have avoided uh, giving you a definition because there is in fact a debate in the community right now as to what it is that learning analytics means. Last, I think last week, maybe two weeks ago, there's been an open commentary released in the Journal for Learning Analytics um, prompted by the original piece written by colleagues that's called A Lack of Direction, a response with 12 commentaries that says, aligning the goals of learning analytics uh, with its research scholarship, where different colleagues wrote different opinion pieces on what they think learning analytics should serve. Um, I'll tell you, these are the different things that were named, and we're talking about basically 14 different opinions, and this is the diversity of opinions within those 14 opinions. So learning analytics should close the loop, or it should advance learning theory, or it should improve social justice as a primary goal, okay? That's, that's basically the conversation. It should improve learning process. It should differentiate improvement of learning process versus improvement of learning outcomes. Colleagues argue for causality and causal research. 
uh, bring short-term meaningful improvement in practice. Some colleagues say, it doesn't matter what's gonna happen in 100 years, I need to make a difference now in my classroom at the end of the class, that should be my primary goal. Some others say, no, we need to care about long-term learning outcomes. And some others say, no, learning analytics has to bridge practitioner and research work, that's so special about us. Now, I'm bringing this up to make a point that there is a lot of opinion as to what this field should do. And I think that's something that's really being negotiated. But at the end of the day, the elements that I've discussed earlier on, so the presence of data that comes from educational technologies, feedback loops, and uh, process of learning, that would describe most of learning analytics works regardless what it is trying to achieve. So that's why I don't give you a definition of the purpose because I think it's an open question in the community. Now, I'd like to conclude this part of the talk with my own view on what learning analytics is. And I have argued over this view with my colleagues. I know not everybody in my own community agrees either. But in my view, learning analytics is uniquely positioned as a middle ground space. So I don't know if you know of a middle ground space. It's like a neutral space where different people with different agendas come together and they sort of have to drop their agendas because the point of being there is to kind of find a solution. So for me, learning analytics is uniquely positioned as this middle ground space between learners, teachers, institutional stakeholders, data and pedagogical practice, and that middle space wants to find practical solutions. And so it's a neutral ground where all of these agendas have to kind of rub shoulders and figure out, well, how do we make this work? And because of this uniqueness, it actually can have sci real scientific impact, not just practical impact, in a way where I think my community can develop theories about how learning and teaching happens. Because we sit in a place that nobody else does, and we see things through lenses that other disciplines don't. So I think normal scientific process is a way to go, but developing theory is also a part, our own theory of how we think things actually happen in complex educational systems is something that we can contribute to. In my own work, I differentiate between three pieces or three problem spaces, if you like, that describe learning analytics. So one of them is indicators. That's those complex, really nuanced measures of how can we measure something about learning and teaching that can inform us about a theory. Another part is analytics. So I differentiate between indicators and analytics because I think indicators need to be nuanced to capture the complexity, but analytics need to be packaged in a way that I can convey it and communicate it. And so there must be a relationship between indicators and analytics, but they're not the same thing. And working out how your nuanced indicator can become something that is an analytics piece is not trivial in an educational uh, setting. And the last problem space for me is sense making. So it's not enough to give feedback, but we have to make sure that we understand how learners uptake it so that they can actually act on it. And that is what makes this process social. Um, when I wrap this talk up at the end of it, I will come back to these three because I will talk about the intersection of LA and artificial intelligence through the lens of these three things. Um, so where do they intersect in terms of making or producing new indicators that can explain theory, where they can do something about communicating what's happening about learning through the form of analytics and how does sense making of feedback happens. That was the, sec the end of the second block. I hope you're still with me. I'll slow down a little bit. AI in education. So I want to talk about artificial intelligence in education. And as I said, it's not a lecture. It's going to be a little bit of historical discourse. But the point that I want to make, I'll give it up to you up front, and then I'll try to unpack it. And my point is, AI in education is a long tradition of work and scholarship. And what we're doing today with new forms of AI does not differ tremendously from what was envisioned back then. However, despite of this, we still should be paying attention because the new forms of AI can have impact on literacy. Remember the print and press metaphor in the beginning? So that's the argument I'd like to walk you through in the next X minutes, hopefully. And I also want to make sure that it's clear that I'm taking a scholar perspective because we have different rhetoric that comes from policy groups, so AI is fear, AI is automation, AI is gonna put us out of jobs, I'm not talking about that. 
also industry looks at AI, how can we optimize, how can we make things more profitable? And then researchers take different perspectives. This particular one, it comes from a paper from uh, Oxford Institute. Um, and they, they call it methodology, but I, I don't quite subscribe to that metaphor, but I think distinction is important. That's my role. I'm talking as a researcher. I'm not talking as a policymaker or um, as an entrepreneur here. And so in preparation for this piece on AI ed, I looked at the recent chapter by Gordon McCullough, highly recommended for those who, do not, who haven't witnessed the history themselves. He does an excellent job outlining um, what happened in the past. He refers to AI, in education, AI, ed, AI in education as applied field with the goal of creating software that helps people learn better. He refers to some very early examples of feedback machines. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the teaching machines. Uh, you know, some people are nodding. If you haven't, you can look it up. It's, uh, there are some images of what that looked like back then. More importantly, uh, he talks about the first era of AI ed from 40s to 80s. I'm not giving you details. I want you to note what problems they were trying to solve, not how they were solving it, not what technology they had, but what they were trying to do. So they were trying to figure out how to support problem solving in STEM domains. They were trying to diagnose problem solving technology strategies. They were trying to devise pedagogical approaches to help students overcome issues. They were doing it by, uh, by means of student modeling. Of course, the technology was different, but the thinking, I, I don't see a lot of difference with some of the thinking we have today. Now, the second era of AI ed from the 80s to um, basically almost end of the century. We're talking about the development of ITS architecture. Uh, ITS is intelligent tutoring systems, which are underpinned by a particular cognitive uh, learning theory, which presumes that a learner enters, enters the system as a novice and goes through the system to become an expert. And so there's a cognitive model of an expert at the end, an entire sequence of activities is structured like that. Because of this focus on cognitive and technical part of it, cognitive development and the technical part of it, you see things like knowledge representation. So structured domains were picked up such as programming and mathematics because they can be represented, the relationships between are easier to represent. Student modeling, so how do we model what students are doing within this pedagogical component, mostly referred to topics to be adapted to the student needs. Communication component, we're not talking about natural language processing, we're talking about querying terminology terms so the student can basically talk to the system to find something out. And cognitive tutoring, so what now is known as the work coming from Ken Kuttinger and CMU, that work, but also what happened before that, right? We're talking about a little bit earlier. So that tradition. And also was very heartwarming for me to see in the 90s early work by people like Peter Goodyear, Yulada Vasilyeva, Brusilovsky, Dubulay Vasan, who were looking at pedagogical strategies with cognitive systems, meaning that there were people who were understanding that ITS and the cognitive development of the technological development was not enough. We also have to consider the social aspect of how these different sequences are being presented and taught within that, and the authoring environments and frameworks. Again, my focus here is on the ideas that floated around at the time, not the way how technology, what technology was accommodating. At the same time, similar ideas floated. So collaborative and social learning approaches, very early work by Pierre Dillenburg on how do we talk to a computer to teach it. Um, work on reflective activity, self-explanation, prompting learners to self-explain so that they can learn better. And that's also the beginning of open learner models. Now, if you are going, if you've ever been, which I'm sure quite a few of you were, at AI ed conferences or EDM conferences, you know that this is not very different from what we're doing today. And so then the question is, is this new form, uh, are the new emergent forms of artificial intelligence that we're picking up in education, are they really different? Should we be worried? Or is that just a continuation that's been hyped up within the media? Um, I looked at the literature review coming from the Monash University team, also recently released in Bidjet. They looked at 118 papers to see what are the applications of large language models in education. Categories of use cases included profiling and detection, grading teaching support, prediction, knowledge representation, feedback, content generation, and recommendation. 
They counted this. I don't know how well you can see the labels at the bottom. I'll read. Automate educational tasks such as questions grading generation, over 80 papers. Feedback on resource recommendation, over 50 papers. Support institutional practices or so recommender systems for courses, uh, 20 papers or so. Automated methods for latent constructs, so identifying confusion, identifying frustration from stream data. Well, it's just a little bit over 10. Um, and so to me, these don't look like novel applications. And maybe you can argue that I haven't reflected enough on this, and I'm happy to discuss that. But the question I'm asking is that if the use cases are the same as what people were working on a long time ago, then what's the buzz? Why, why should we be discussing all of these things now? Is there really something different now? Um, I looked at different things and opinion pieces that came out over the last seven months. I like this one quite a lot. Coming from the uh, group at uh, University of California, Irvine, Mark Warshauer has been working with writing systems and literacy, and this is the group of people associated with him at different seniority levels. So they make an argument around large language models and writing and literacy, and I thought that was the most compelling argument I've seen that convinced me that, yeah, I should be paying attention. So first of all, they say there are new things we need to teach students, and they are different from what we taught them before. So students need large language, large language model specific knowledge. They also need functional knowledge because writing tasks, which is one of the instances where we try to adopt that, they have different functions across communicative contexts. So students need to understand how to use it differently for different types of writing genres. And then we need to teach students how to prompt. Well, that, none of this should surprise you. This is a part of the regular discourse by now that should be familiar. Uh, as to that, yeah, we need to do that if we want to see large language models adopted in the classroom. But they make two other points that I thought were a little bit uh, different. They asked, well, what are the implications for the learning process and for the learning outcomes? Do students become better writers with this new technology or without it? That's a question we do not know the answer to. How do students learn using various prompting and editing techniques? So if it scaffolds me through, if I write collaboratively, how does that impact my process? What does that process look like? What does the outcome look like? We also don't know these answers. Um, that's, scholar, that's scholarly work. But then they also take another stance on the learning theory, saying that our theories talk about learning from language natural language in natural environments from humans and we use tools. So now that we have other kind of tools and other kind of language, how does that change how we learn? And how, does, how do our theories that exist, how do they explain these processes? And to me, that's profound because I believe that the theory or the knowledge, the models of the world that we hold, they explain our actions and our things. So if something if the model I have doesn't explain this new phenomena, I cannot predict <laughs> anymore because I don't have the lens that captures that. So to me, that was the most compelling part was like, well, they, they are right. If I think about literacy, if I think about the printing press, if I think about the fact that I cannot know the impact today, there is a potential that the impact may be more transformative than I can imagine. So I should be paying attention. Doesn't mean I can take a stance, but at least I should be paying attention. It's not just a buzz, it's a little bit different. Let's just put it that way. And importantly, it's not just writing. So this is, this is a blog post by somebody who talks about automating reading practices. I don't know. And I think that's, if, if you miss most of my talk and you come out of this and you keep thinking about these questions, I think that's the one that's really worth reflecting. How would this impact literacy, literacy in your domain? Um, so that's the end of uh, the third block. I am still there, 28 minutes, you are with me. Thank you so much, I really appreciate that. So we talked about the intersection, talk is about intersections of learning analytics and AI. I told you what I think learning analytics is, and then I told you that I think the new forms of AI are worth paying attention for. So now I want to talk about the dangers, and that's where I come back to Solomon, who I cited in the beginning. So what can be the promise of learning analytics and AI? 
I'd like to rephrase that because the promises can be many, but what's actually worth doing? Our time and resources are limited. So Solomon wrote in that 2002 piece, what keeps education from undergoing the kind of pedagogical change that the new brave world of novel technology has promised? He gives three reasons what keeps the world of educational technology away from achieving its promises. One is trivializing a good thing. The second is the technocentric focus. And the third is the misguided research. Remind you, this is a piece from 2002. Trivializing a good thing is when technology is allowed to do precisely that which fits into the prevailing educational philosophy of cultural transmission and training for the world of yesterday. Most powerful and innovative technology is taken and domesticated, trivialized, such that it does more or less what its predecessors have done, only it does it a bit faster and a bit nicer. I, I think a lot of the applications we're seeing today, maybe not from the scholarly world, which is why I want to differentiate, but that's a reminder from the past. The second one is the techno technocentric focus. So that's when we think that technology will bring change on its own, and that not knowledge that we're producing in the learning process, but technology itself becomes the promise and the centerpiece. And that's when we think that access to information is equal to knowledge. My whole explanation of what happened with remote teaching is that it just the way people talk about remote teaching and COVID is that they just forgot that access to information didn't equal to teaching. Um, that also means that when we take a technocentric focus on new technologies, we forget that knowledge building requires co-presence, mentorship, tutelage is the word Solomon uses, mentorship or scaffolding, and community of learners. But I don't think that educational technology community actually suffers from that because this is something we've been doing for many years. And even if you start there, just it takes you five to seven years to realize that, hey, there is a world outside of just building a tech and I have to look broader. But this one worries me a little bit more. So it's misguided research. Um, so Solomon talks about papers that uh, ask questions. Does the use of medium X produce better learning results than medium Y, usually a teacher? He, call, he calls this the horse race approach. Who teaches faster, a teacher or an online education? I, that, but I can see different reactions from the audience, but just do a Google search on differences between online and face-to-face, -face, and you can see studies like that from basically decades back. So he criticizes this approach and says that researching who teaches faster, who leads to more traditional achievements, disregards aptitudes, tasks, contents, and contexts. And he also says that a lot of this research ends up looking at traditional achievements and new technology should not be viewed as the mean to attain the same old goals of traditional education. There's nothing wrong with three R's, he says, but introducing new technology is not to do the same things better. It's not to do the same things better. It's to do things differently. It's to reach profound improvements. Variety of outcome variables need to be considered. So to remind you, ask yourself, what is literacy in my domain? And how can I, does that change? And what can technology do here? And of course, the first two reinforce the third. So then I ask, um, where to? Well, Solomon concludes his piece by saying, the tool merely offers affordances and opportunities, but for what? And then there's a bigger question, what do we want education to become? I tried to think about question one, which is what are the affordances and opportunities, looking at the emergent research uh, on large language models in education. Now, this is a very, very selective analysis. So just to give you food for thought, and if you disagree with some of the ways I talk about it, even better. So papers have looked at applications of automating feedback. Findings, and I pick people whose work I trust, so it's not representative. Students who had access to AI-generated feedback in programming tasks performed better, but less likely to solve correctly immediately when the feedback was removed, though corrected reasonable fast. Over-reliance on feedback, Ryan Baker's work and his colleague Pankevich. Another study, Zach Pardos, human hints in algebra tasks produced better learning outcomes. 70% of ChatGPT produced hints 
passed manual quality checks. Um, I think this is work from Bruce McLaren and his PhD student just got a best paper at ECTEL last week. Chat GPT evaluated correctness of the student answers in math as well as instructors and generated equal quality feedback. And of course, it does better on conceptual questions. It kind of doesn't do as well with math. Now, I, I do have to say that I get a little bit off of who does it better, whether it's a teacher or a system question through this work. But I'd like to say also that probably we can't avoid asking this, at least in the beginning. The question is, will we be asking this for the next 10 years? Hopefully not. So very much of this is very ITS tradition and teacher medium comparison. Maybe we shouldn't call it feedback because in reality, we're not looking at feedback and there are theories at feedback literacies and where we're comparing these, we're looking at correctness. And of course, a lot of these uh, things do not account for what Solomon asked us to think about such as content. So what kind of domain, context, process, task, participant characteristics. And also because this is very much in the old intelligent children systems traditions, it doesn't really, it's not embedded in more open-ended systems. So I asked some of my colleagues who I know are doing work as to what they are doing. So this example comes from the University of Queensland uh, from Hassan Khosravi. Uh, he's built AI-based scaffolds uh, to support various pro processes in peer-based learner sourcing systems. For those who don't know, that's the link to his system. I'll tell a little bit as to what it does. It's not instructor-led, so students, students are invited inside. They can create materials, then they can moderate anonymously other people's tasks. So the student come in and can create a task that they're studying in a course. They can moderate other people's and they can be suggested as to what it is that they should study. So it's not your curriculum, it's a learner sourcing system. The type of tasks they can create is varied. A lot of different things they can create. And so he's embedded some of the language model based uh, scaffolds at each of these steps. So helping students create better tasks. So you have a little prompt there at the, on the side. You have it also during moderation. There are some um, pieces that come in. And um, I think the last one also, there are suggest suggestions now that are uh, prompted, um, prompt a student to do different activities. What I like about this is that it doesn't try to do exactly the same thing that was done in intelligent children systems before. It is traditional enough, but it still has this open-endedness and uh, human-machine interaction that's not guided by the teacher. So there's an emergence that could happen on the intersection of how this happens. So the first example was automating feedback. That's in the literature. The second example is generating content courses a little bit of research. So ChatGPT creates tasks that are as correct as those created by teachers from the textbook. Students using the textbook achieved a higher clarity and more frequently embedded their questions in a meaningful context. Teachers did better, yay. Content created with large language models is clearer, but less accurate. And I think what we should be taking so far from those things is like, okay, well, they can do some things, but not entirely. The the, you need a human in the loop regardless. So the thoughts on these kind of activities that I ask myself are, what are the implications for teacher agency? And what are the negative implications of such offloading? In other words, it's clear that generating tasks will make teachers' life easier. But for how long and what are the implications is not clear and we have to really think about it. Um, the approach that my colleagues at the University of South Australia are using, they're building a new system of generating courses, but at a level that's beyond a micro level. So institutional change. If we roll out AI, course generation, and if we template it, can we transform how all our instructors think about learning design and learning analytics? So there, I, I also, I find that angle preferable because it does take something that technology obviously can do, but it positions us in a larger system and ask what outcomes can I create with this on a system level? So using AI-generated course design for institutional transformation. 
comes from the Center of Change and Complexity in Learning. They rolled out courses on AI literacy first so that they are working with the instructors trying to explain what kind of things are needed uh, from an instructor so that an instructor can understand these new tools that come their way. And then I'm not going to go through huge, but it's not my work. Um, so my colleague Srej Koyokshimovich explained to me that what they are trying to do is that they're building a piece that allows instructors to brainstorm and develop courses, then automate course deployment, and then also automate embedded data analytics within it so that they are building the entire system that allows an instructor to think of the entire course design as well as analytics together. Um, can look something like that, where you have topics for brainstorming, but you can also have an AI assist button that helps you generate things. Um, and that also can help you revise certain objectives you're writing. And that also can, can help you map whether all your objectives are covered in terms of the design of the course and quizzes and things like that. So that's the second application. Automating feedback was one. Second was generating uh, courses. And then there is work about share, around shared cognitive systems. Um, and I find that one very compelling because if you paid attention to the first two, you would have noticed that it doesn't, what it tells us that we need a combination of capabilities from a human and a machine to leverage the affordances of the new AI tools. And that it seems that that can be done in combination and complementary. And so to me, that's the key of the affordance that comes through. And so I, I'd like to invite you to reflect whether that is whether you agree with that, let's put it that way. So shared cognitive systems, what kind of examples exist in the research? That was one of the things that I thought was very, very convincing to me. Work on creating AI tools towards agentic engagement. So what comes from also CMU group, you have a number of CMU colleagues, Erin Walker, Amy Organ, uh, Angela Stewart, Agentic engagement means students' constructive contribution into the flow of instruction, includes expressing interests, preferences, and opinions. The kids talk to AI, and the social dialogue invites them to reflect how they might want to change the system or the dialogue. It makes space for the kids to imagine how they can enhance the dialogue system to implement preferences. So they don't just engage, they're required to engage in a way where they exercise their agency towards shaping the system. And to me, that's interesting because I haven't seen much work on this. And I think that it elicits this agency that we can have in humans while working with machines. Rather than machines shaping our activities, we can exercise what we want them to become within this specific task. Then there is work on or conversation about how tools and learning analytics, including, hence can support human AI co-orchestration. Talking about analytics here, we're mostly talking about things like cognitive load in the classroom. So how can automation or automated technology help teacher reduce cognitive load when they're teaching? I mean, I'm sure you have large student classes with a lot of students. That's always been a problem we can co-orchestrate that activity and we can do it easier today and there are schemes of how that should work. Um, Ken Holstein and Nicole Rummel uh, wrote a piece that defines how that can be shared conceptually and I think that's one of the promising ways where we can also design technologies for. Then this one was fairly new for me. Uh, it's it's preprint. I think it's going to be presented in a couple months. Shared decision making. So I found that paper fascinating uh, because the colleagues studied how critical use of the tool changes. So they had, um, I think it was medical students looking at predictions and they were evaluating how the novices would over time become more expert-like in their judgment, but how their critical use and trust to the prediction results would also change with the different ways of how the system was built. In other words, we can build systems that develop our critical thinking while we're trying to make decisions that come in real time. Of course, we're, you know, this is, I mean, all, a lot of big words, but I think the idea is there, which is if we're looking at the shared cognitive system that we will use things for decision making, um, studies like that show that you can actually improve critical use. So not the grade, okay? 
not the accuracy of my decision, although sometimes that may be important depending on the context, but my ability to think, my literacy can be um, affected in a positive manner. And then I think the work that hasn't been done, but will have, my sense is that will develop, is analytics of shared processes. So right now there's been a lot of work on assessment and authenticity and cheating, but what it really does, or some of it, like this paper from the colleagues, um, I think also from Monash, it detects which sentences were written by the human and which were written from the machine, which technically should allow us to build analytics that can show humans how much they are relying on automated writing, in what kind of scenarios they are relying on automated writing, how they're learning from automated writing, et cetera, et cetera. So right now these systems don't exist. The systems that exist only sort of flag what's written by whom with different levels of accuracy. But I think the vision for analytics for shared cognitive systems can be that we can be co-writers, but we then need to create tools that can help humans reflect on how they're learning or writing. So um, looking at these examples, if you are critical think, I mean, I, anybody uh, who thinks critically about these issues would ask, well, how much do you offload in this shared cognitive system? And what are the effects? How much should you trust the input uh, of the system? How do we scaffold the processes that we learn with machines? Um, and the, the work that I am starting to do, so I won't present much of what we're finding, but we're looking at how do we distribute learning analytics insights uh, between the learner and um, AI feedback within a programming environment. So we are trying to do some initial experiments with colleagues uh, from applied software engineering at uh, TOM funded by Munich Data Science Institute. So for me, this question of how do we distribute decision-making in educational context is an interesting one. And uh, maybe I'll have a little bit more to say on what does that look like in practice about a year from now. 45 minutes in, I'm getting to the point. I'd like to come back to Solomon who wrote this paper in 1991. That was a build on his solo paper from 1988. I really admire this uh, narrative that he produced. It's called Partners in Cognition, Extending Human Intelligence with Intelligent Technologies. He asked uh, with colleagues, he wrote this, uh, can machines make people more intelligent? More specifically, with the increasing use of intelligent computer programs, tools, and related technologies in education, it may be an opportune time to ask whether they have any effect on student intellectual performance and ability. He outlines a conceptual framework where he says we need to be thinking about two different things. One is effects with technology. So can I do what I'm doing better? Effects obtained during the partnership with technology. But he also talks about effects of technology. So what happens to me after I leave technology and go away? What's the effect? What's the cognitive residue that this partnership leaves behind? And I don't see a lot of research on that, but some I think, attempts to think that way, which is something that I find very encouraging. He argues that cognitive effects with computer depend on mindful engagement of learners in the tasks afforded by these tools, and that there is a possibility of qualitatively upgrading the performance of the joint system. He says, now it's a time to ask, is ability a measure of my own or is a measure of a system? If it's a human AI system, does ability reflect what we can do collectively or what can I do with it? And I think that's a question that really cuts into the whole assessment debate quite a lot. And then there is a question of transfer. Can we engineer learning scenarios where students use these kind of technologies where we have these shared cognitive partnerships in a way that would transfer to their work scenarios. And that's also goes to assessment questions quite a bit, I think. So in the last few minutes left, I want to talk about the intersection. So I thought a lot and I thought, okay, well, what do I think, what can I imagine on this? And I thought of two things. First, I think that the new generation of learning analytics, if you like, could look at learning analytics for shared cognitive systems. And another one is adaptable learning analytics because the new affordances, the affordances of new AI tools allow the system to adapt. We can finally talk about technology that a learner can adapt in different scenarios, maybe not quite yet to an extent that I imagine it.
So not a tool that adapts to a learner on their own, having a student model, but a tool that a learner can adapt. I don't know if I'm making that distinction clear. So you may remember that I talked about learning analytics as having three problem spaces. One is indicators. So measuring learning processes. Second is analytics, so communicating about learning to the stakeholder. And the third is sense-making. It's practices, it's our social practices that is supporting how we can act on that feedback. And so I think when I imagine analytics and practices for shared socio-technical cognitive systems, I can imagine that uh, in that distant future possibly, we can work on indicators of what learners do and what AI does as mapped to learning processes and outcomes such as writing, self-regulation and communication. We also need to think, well, how do we communicate about these in analytics that can inform learners about the trade-offs trade, trade of uploading because these are the choices we want people to make rather than not being able to make. And then, of course, when I talked about sense-making, that's where I think of adaptable learning analytics. And the way I think of adaptable learning analytics is kind of, um, you know, when I track my things with a marker, I mark it with a pen, and then I don't like the pen anymore, I put it aside, and I try to do it in a different way. So I adapt my tools to the way I like it. And I imagine that in some future, we can make dashboards, if you like, that I can change depending on my needs as I realize them, because as a novice learner, I might not actually know what my needs are. So at 50 minutes mark, I congratulate you on the end of this argument. Uh, thank you so much.